AP Biology Chapter 25. This is our third and final video on the chapter of maintaining or controlling our internal environment, which is a discussion of homeostasis. In video one, we talked about thermoregulation. In video two, we talked about osmoregulation. And then in this third and final video, we'll be talking about the removal of nitrogen or kind of waste from the body. So nitrogenous wastes are wastes that are basically being made through the breakdown of nucleic acids and proteins. And so when our body does metabolism as a way of getting nutrients out of the food we get, it's actually making a number of these toxic byproducts. Um, specifically the nitrogen waste. And the nitrogen waste comes from the breaking down of protein. Sorry, I'm going to move this video back a little bit. And what happens is the type of nitrogen waste that's formed depends upon what kind of animal you are, what kind of environment you're in. And so when we break down protein and amino or, and nucleic acids to make nitrogenous waste, if you are an aquatic animal, uh, more than likely you're going to be making ammonia. And so if we look here at our video, here's our protein, here's our nucleic acids that we take in through our food. When we break them down in metabolism, we're going to be producing the individual monomers of amino acids or nitrogen bases. Those, when we get to them, are going to be producing a waste product that is the amino group, the NH2. We will convert the amino group into ammonia if you're an aquatic animal um, because ammonia is soluble in water. And so, again, it's able to simply just, the nitrogen waste is simply able to just diffuse out of the animal. But if you're a mammal or an amphibian, um, sharks, there's even some fishes, um, you have to use energy to create a nitrogenous waste that's called urea. And if you're a bird, you're going to actually be creating a nitrogenous waste called uric acid. Urea is less toxic, and so it's easier to store it in our body before we're able to excrete it. Urea is actually being made in the liver, and remember, the liver is closely associated with the digestive system. Um, and then the, what the liver makes urea, it takes it and it uses the circulatory system to get it to our kidneys, which is ultimately how we excrete things from our body. However, birds are making something called uric acid. And uric acid is this virtually dry waste. And I'm sure you've all had seen bird poop um, out in the environment. And that little black dot is the uric acid that's making up of it. It is not soluble in water. The problem with making urea and uric acid is that they take energy, so it requires ATP. Now, as I said, the liver is what's making the urea in most mammals. And what happens is that urea is then put to our kidneys to leave the body. But the liver is doing a lot of other things. Urea is responsible for breaking down any toxins that we may ingest into our body from drugs or alcohol. It's what makes the bile. And bile, as we talked about in Chapter 21, is responsible for breaking down fat. And so we can use it to then reorganize and make things that are important for blood clotting or making cell membranes. Um, the other thing it's doing is it's actually controlling how much sugar or glucose is in the blood. If we have too much glucose, it will convert it to glycogen for storage. If we don't have enough glucose, it will take glycogen and convert it to glucose and let it be free in our blood so our cells can use it. So by doing that, it actually regulates our body's metabolism. It can also adjust how much nutrients are in the blood, which is why when we go from the digestive system, small intestine, circulatory system, it goes straight to the liver. The liver is kind of what's sorting and deciding, all right, this is what needs to happen with this nutrient or this nutrient. The, because of the role liver plays, it has this vital location in our body directly between our intestines, which is where the nutrients come from, and our heart, which is part of the circulatory system. What's happening with our liver, and it's this ginormous organ in our body, is that it is connected to the liver by this ginormous vein, which has lots of blood in it. Um, it's called the hepatic portal vein. And it's easily identified when we cut open or dissect our fetal pigs. Now, one of the things about livers is that they can be damaged. If you consume too much alcohol, um, you can develop hepatitis, which is a bacterial infection. Um, or you can develop cirrhosis, which is scarring. Um, and what happens is that scar tissue replaces the actual good liver tissue. And by doing that, we diminish how much blood and how many cells are operating in the liver. There's approximately 25,000 people that die every year from cirrhosis of the liver. 
Much of that can be prevented by living a lifestyle that's free of alcohol, free of drugs, and not putting yourself at risk for catching a hepatitis infection. Now, the, as we were saying, the liver plays a role, and then it sends the ure urea that it makes to the kidneys. The kidneys are part of our excretory system, and the excretory system is what gets rid of any waste and controls how much water and how much ions we have, so we'll get rid of any excess as that as well. Um, and we have two kidneys. They're about the size of your closed fist, and they're full of capillaries. So the blood is basically full of the circulatory system. And the cool thing about it is that based on the structure of a kidney, the, the function really closely follows it. For On average, you're going to expel or pee out about 1.5 liters of urine a day. Now, what the kidney does is it filters everything via what's called the renal artery. And so what happens is the kidney filters everything out collects our urine, so whatever we want to get rid of for the excretory system, travels it through the ureters, puts it into your bladder where it's stored until eventually it leaves the body through the urethra. There are two main parts to a kidney, and you can identify them if you were to slice a kidney open. There's the renal cortex, which is this dark outer layer, and then the renal medulla, which is this inner region. Um, and we will be expecting you to know all of the parts and then to know what's the function. Now, there's two main parts. However, the nephrons are actually the type of functional unit that's in the kidney. And the nephron is actually what does the filtration. And so we want to look at this in more detail. So here's your kidney. If you look, you'll see you can see the renal medulla and the renal cortex. Uh, renal cortex is this outer layer right here. And the renal medulla is this part in here. So let's talk about what's going on within the kidney. We have something called the Bowman's capsule. And what the Bowman's capsule is, is this little cup that holds a whole bunch of capillaries all balled up together. And we call that the glomerulus. Now, the reason why we have that is because this is where all the blood's coming in. It's starting to be as part of our nephron. And by having the glomerulus there, we're allowing a lot of blood to come in and be sorted and filtered. And now we can take out what we want and get rid of what we want or prepare it to go to the excretory system. Now, I'm going to be jumping back and forth, but I want you to see this. So here's the Bowman's capsule, and this ball of reddish blue is called the glomerulus. Now, what we have from here is our proximal, our loop of Henle, and our distal. So let's go back. What happens is we've broken down a nephron into three parts, the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, and then the distal tubule. What's happening in the loop of Henle, that big long loop, is that we're actually allowing blood to go from the cortex into the medulla and then back out to the cortex. The main function of the loop of Henle is to reabsorb water. So don't get rid of anything that we might need. It's our, one of our last chances. Now, the distal tubule is the last chance of in the nephron to actually balance out all of our ions and solutes and water before we take it out and put it into our bladder. So here it is. What's going on is that we're going to break it down step by step. So here's our Bowman's capsule, our glomerulus, our proximal tubule, loop of Henle, distal tubule, and then this right here is what leads to the excretory system, or basically your bladder. So if we were to look at this very closely, this is a breakdown of what's happening. So you can actually identify and see the renal cortex. You can see the medulla. The medulla actually appears kind of more of a dark purple. It's full of blood vessels. And then within that, you can actually see that only the Bowman's capsule <clears throat> And the distal and proximal tubules, the loop of Henle is actually found in the renal medulla. Otherwise, everything else is up in the cortex. Now what's happening here in this, de this kind of di detailed diagram is that what we're doing is we're filtering the blood through in a one-directional pathway as a way of taking out as much water and as much solutes as possible before it goes down the collecting duct that then ultimately leads to the bladder. Now, what's going on is we're going to be doing three things in this. We're going to be filtering, so we're filtering the water and the blood and all that. 
And then we're going to be reabsorbing anything that we might need. And then we're going to be secreting anything that we need. We're going to be secreting or getting rid of any sort of excess hydrogen ions or toxins, any sort of extra vitamins or minerals or extra water. And so basic, once we're doing the, the excretion, is the kidneys filter everything. They reabsorb everything. And then they transfer things to the, through the ureters to the bladder, from the bladder to the urethra, and then it leaves our body as urine. So let's take a closer look and focus very closely on what's happening. So here we can see our Bowman's capsule. Here's our glomerulus. What we're doing is we're filtering. So what's happening is these blood vessels, these are thin, single-cell walled capillaries, what we're allowing to happen as we go through the nephron is we're allowing water and other molecules to travel. And we're reabsorbing any water or molecules into our capillaries and we're taking out of our capillaries or blood anything that we don't need. So we're getting ready to secrete and then excrete. So if we look at it kind of in a closer format, this is probably the most uh, or the best diagram. So here we are. Here's our blood coming in our Bowman's capsule and our glomerulus. In the proximal tubule, what's happening is we're actually going to be getting rid of drugs and poisons, so they're going to enter into our nephron, but we're going to be taking out nutrients, salt, water, anything that we might need, amino acids. They're all going to be reabsorbed by the, um, by the kidney. So then what can happen is whatever is still in our nephron will then travel down the loop of Henle. Now, the loop of Henle on this way down is only concerned with taking out water. Once we've reabsorbed as much water as possible, we now are going to, on the opposite side, we are now going to reabsorb salt. And by doing that, what we're doing is we're creating a concentration difference where there's high water concentration or we're taking out as much water as possible at the get-go so that when we go over to the salt side, we now have high solute, low water. And so now the salt will travel from high concentration to low concentration, and it will leave the nephron and then re-enter the cells in the kidney for, um, for distribution throughout the body. Now, once all of this has traveled back up and we're back up into that cortex region again, now we're in the distal tubule. Again, what we're doing is we're trying to take out any molecules that we might need to reabsorb, and we're getting rid of any excess high, um, ions. Once that's done, we now go down into a collecting duct, which then leads to the ureters, which goes to the bladder, and then we expel urine as f through the urethra. One of the coolest things is that there is a hormone, so our endocrine system plays a role in determining how much water we're going to take out of our kidneys. So the brain makes a hormone called the antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. And what happens is the antidiuretic hormone says, don't pee, hold on to as much water as you can. And so what happens is the kidneys start reabsorbing as much water as possible. Whereas if you have diuresis, what's happening is the body is saying, hey, we don't need any more water, go pee, go pee, get rid of it. And so we don't reabsorb as much water. And so then the collecting duct is controlled by that endocrine or hormonal system. One of the big things is that if your kidneys are not working, you can have huge problems. Thank goodness we have technology that does kidney dialysis. What a dialysis machine does is it uses computers to determine how much waste should be taken out of the blood, um, how much water should remain. And by doing that, it acts as a replacement for the kidney itself. There we are, that is our excretory system.